Hello, I'm Stefan Kreber, Project Leader for Lexity, and with this video, starting a bit of a new series going over the different devices uh, that Lexity supports. Devices are usually attached to either instances or a profile that an instance uses, and we've got quite a, quite a variety of devices. With this one, we're going to be focusing on the disk device. The disk device is a bit special in Lexity. Uh, that's because it's the only device that's actually mandatory. Uh, you can totally start an instance without any network attached to it, but you cannot start an instance without a disk. Um, that's, I mean, that makes some amount of sense because obviously Lexity needs somewhere to put the actual file system and all the data for the instance. So if you don't have a disk, that doesn't really work. This, the disk device is also very, very versatile and supports a lot of different um, different ways of being used. Um, the first one, as mentioned, is using it for the root volume of the instance. Uh, that's, that one makes sense. Uh, then we've got, um, it can also be used to attach additional file system volumes to an instance. So that's when you go and create a custom storage volume inside of a LXT storage pool, and then you attach that to one or multiple, v uh, multiple containers or VMs. Then the same can be done, but using a block volume instead. Uh, that can currently only be attached to a virtual machine, but that's effectively attaching additional disks to a virtual machine. You can also use it to pass in a file system from the host, either to a container or virtual machine, it works on both. It can be used to also pass in an existing block device from the host directly into a VM. Uh, it can be used to create a Cladinate config drive for those virtual machines that don't know how to talk to Lexi directly. It can be used to directly attach to Ceph or CephFS to get a particular um, volume directly attached, even when Lexi itself doesn't know about that particular Ceph or CephFS cluster. And it can also be used to attach a CD-ROM drive to virtual machines by passing in a, an ISO file from the host. All right, as far as the, the options on top of that, there are quite a few um, as detailed here in our documentation. That goes from anywhere from uh, configuring the boot priority on the VM so that you can choose which ones of the disk devices should boot, uh, should, should it boot from. Some extra config keys when using Ceph uh, for cluster and username. Some options to limit uh, IO speed that works in some very specific cases these days, but it can be useful. It also has a number of options to control the exact uh, mount entry being created, whether you want to turn on propagation, uh, recursively mount, multiple mounts, uh, set it as read-only, um, whether you need to apply a shifting layer in case your IDs and GIDs don't quite match what you want inside of the instance. You can um, set its size, which is probably one of the most uh, common options that people use. And uh, it can also be marked as required, meaning that if you pass in a device from the host and it's marked as required false, uh, the instance will be allowed to start up even if the device is not currently present. So that's a bit of an overview of the different things you can do with the disk device and all of the uh, config options. Now let's try and play with, with that stuff. All right. So here I'm in a pretty blank XD project with just two instances running, a container and a virtual machine. The first thing you can look at is just the config that you get out of that. So by default for both C1 and V1, you'll notice that there are no devices listed. That's because they come from the profile and the profile itself has the configuration for the, the root volume. So if we do expand it to see the profile config too, uh, now we can see here that is there's a with device that's taken from the default storage pool in this case. Now, the most common thing to do really uh, with those devices would be override its size. So if we go and override the root disk and now we set it to say 10 gigs, actually, let me just show you how that looks first. So prior to it being modified, we can see the entire host at 431 gigs and then do a device override on on it down to 10 gigs and now we can see it set to 10 gigs here. The other thing that's pretty common would be to create additional storage volumes. So you can do a storage volume create in the default storage pool in this case and I'll create a new volume called foo and set it a size of 20 gigs. And 
and another one called bar set it a size of 50 gigs and this one will make it a block type volume all right and now let's attach those so for the vm we're going to stop it switch to that now and let's attach foo to both of them so let's do c1 foo it's a disk the pool is coming from its default the source is foo and we want to mount that in mount foo okay that's the container done that's the vm done and let's start the vm back and then let's go see what that looks like in the container first so in the container here we can see 20 gigs mount foo is, is there and let's just write something to it so mount foo uh, actually so echo world in file hello so now we've got that file in place and if we go inside of the vm exact same thing and we can see here that it's also mounted with 20 gigs so that works seamlessly across container and vms it's pretty nice and flexible now let's try and use the other one so to v1 we want to attach bar and this one is a disk so it doesn't take a path add it and if we go in there you notice that it's not mounted it's not listed in there at all but if we look at the kernel log we're gonna see that an event happened with the a new block device appearing 50 gigs large and now if we do at cat ls block we can see 50 gigs uh, sdb uh, at that point you could go and partition it or just straight up format it and you can then mount that to an srv and there you go you've got your additional disk now something else we can do um, in this case i just used the one storage pool but actually i have two locally so let's create an additional storage volume but this time on the other storage pool so the storage pool is called remote i'll do remote and we call it uh, bars and do a size of i don't know 25 gigs there we go so that created a new block entry inside of my self cluster, formatted it, um, and now I can use it. So if I do this, I can go back to C1. Let's call it Baz. The pool this time is remote. And the source of it is Baz. Format it to Baz. And now we can see we've got the secondary volume mounted um, at slash mount slash pass. It's 25 gigs large. So that just shows we can easily mix and match between different storage pools of different file systems, and it all works just fine across multiple instances. All right. Um, now let's do something a bit different. We're going to create a new VM. So let's create it as V2. We're going to call it, we're going to make it empty. So it's not created from an image. And just show we can also override the storage pool and effectively create a disk device at creation time. So in this case, I'm doing storage remote. And that means it's going to go directly on onto Ceph in this case. And was there anything else I want to set at this point? Probably not. So just do that. So this is going to be creating a new uh, 10 gigs large volume onto Ceph and make that a VM. If we go look at the config for it, we can see that LexD added a local device uh, for, the, for the root here that shows it's using the remote pool. With that, uh, let's add an ISO drive to that particular VM. So I'm going to be doing that by doing add v2, let's call it install. And it's a disk, and in this case, the source path is going to be an ISO image. So I think it's uh, around here that I have it somewhere. Where is it? Um, Luna the stuff. There we go. So that's the Ubuntu development release. So I'm going to be adding that. And now we can start that particular VM. I'm going to also attach its uh, console, its VGA console. Oops. Yeah, equals. There we go. Okay. So now that VM is starting up, uh, let me just go and share it. Yeah, video. Oops. Screen capture. 
I just need to select the right window. Actually, I think it's going to do the entire screen for this one. So let's do that. Okay. And here we can see the VM is starting up, but it's currently trying to boot over um, over the network because its root disk doesn't actually have um, yeah, the, the root disk of that VM has the priority, but it's currently empty. So to fix that, we can just go, oops, well, we can go back to the terminal here. Just cancel that. Let's both stop the VM. And I'm gonna have to set that uh, boot priority option that I mentioned earlier. So if we go here on the install drive, boot.priority and say done. And then start the VM again with the VGA console. This time it's booting directly from the ISO image. And that's the issue with the loading uh, development image is that this one does not actually boot. Um, it's not an actual problem with the uh, with Lexity of the VM. It's just that I literally downloaded the current development release of Ubuntu, uh, and I, it looks like that particular image does not actually boot. Um, so that that can happen, um, but thankfully we can actually get to see that thanks to the VGA console. If we we're just looking at the text console, that would look a lot more confusing. But in this case, we did get to the the boot menu here. Um, and then try booting. I'm gonna try to save graphics options just in case, but I don't think it will actually boot. I suspect there's just an issue with the bootloader and that image. And uh, looks like there is, yeah, not syncing, not working, init found, failed to execute slash init, uh, failed with right error. Yeah, so there's actually, there's something definitely wrong with that particular image. Maybe a corrupted download, maybe bad kernel or something like that. In any case, uh, that does show how to attach an ISO image directly to a VM. And the last thing I wanted to show is that cladinit config drive. So for that, we're gonna be using our working VM. So V1, I'm just gonna stop V2 so it doesn't waste resources. I'm gonna do a clean stop on V1 and then device add V1. Um, let's call it config, it's a disk. And the source is cloud init config, I believe. There we go, and then start that. I can actually see what's going on on it too. Front. It's effectively booting up right now. Login screen. Okay. So just just show just the terminal, and now if we go inside of that VM, we can see what that particular device looks like. So looking at the block devices now, we can see that there's an additional one. There's a CD-ROM drive that showed up. And that's gonna be our config drive. Again, this particular config drive is not something we usually need because modern Lexd is capable of directly to, uh, modern Lexd images are directly capable of talking to Lexd to get all of the config. But for a few cases where that doesn't work, uh, the, the Cladinate config drive can be used instead. So if we mount that to, uh, where can we mount it? But I haven't mounted something yet. Media. Okay. We can see it shows it's read only because it's the CD-RAM. And if we look inside it, it contains the Cladinit config for the instance. So it's got the instance name and should be pretty much blank for the other two. Yep. So there's just a way to, to pass in a auto-generated CD-RAM drive uh, as well using the disk the disk option. And I think that's it for the overview of most of what can be done uh, through a disk device. As I said, uh, it really supports a lot of different options. Um, I think I've showed just about as many as I could easily. Uh, I did consider showing the CephFS and CephRBD cases, 
but it's a bit tricky because you need to pass in um, not only the Ceph cluster, well, the Ceph uh, cluster URL and everything you want to access, but also credentials for that, uh, which makes it a bit uh, annoying to demo. Um, anyway, for the three special sources, so CephRBD, CephFS, and VMs, you know, and the uh, Cladinit device I just showed, they're showed at the top here. Uh, for just about everything else, you've got the different options listed here. And it actually reminds me there's one thing I can easily show that I did not show. So let me just go back here. Uh, that would be sharing of a device from the host. Well, not a device, a, a path from the host. So let's stop V1 again. And what I'll do is just device adds to both C1 and V1 uh, home, home disk. The source for that will be slash home on the host system. Actually, let me do my full home directory. And let's mount that as MNT home or something like that inside of the instances. So that's for V1, that's for C1, the container, and then V1, and then start C1. Uh, C1 is already running, start V1. Okay. So we can see um, that it's directly possible to access the, um, the home directory in that way. And V1 will let me do the exact same thing. So let's say I want to show my desktop or something like that. You can see the files that are on my desktop. And it's pretty much that easy. Um, just switching back here. So again, that's all of the different options for, for disks. Uh, that's probably the most, I mean, it must be the most used text device because it is mandatory. Um, but I think even outside of the root disk use case, it's pretty commonly used by, by our users to pass in some different paths, whether it's a path within their own directory, or it's like a shared volume to store a database or website or something like that. Um, it's a very versatile device and I hope this overview was useful. So anyway, if you've got any questions about any of this, you can leave them down in the comment section below or on the community forum. I'm going to be linking uh, this documentation page in the um, description of this video. And we'll then be going through a bunch of the other devices uh, over the next few videos. We already have a pretty solid one on GPU, so I don't think that one we'll be redoing. Um, but we'll be doing definitely be doing one to cover the different kind of Unix devices, proxy, uh, USB, PCI devices, networks also already has also already been covered a fair bit. Um, we'll see whether TPM warrants it on video, but maybe it will. And yeah, hopefully that uh, that will give a bunch more options um, to our users. So anyway, um, I'll see you all in the next video.